coming shortly. B-Side Cincinnati 2018 is sponsored by GE Aviation, No Starch Press, CBTS, CyberArk, Booz Allen Hamilton, Dark Rhino Security, Endgame, RSA, and U.S. Bank. Join the conversation. Tweet us at B-Side Cincy. The presentation will begin shortly. B-Side Cincinnati Up next is Matt here, is and he's going to talk to you about active defense. All right, well, thank you, everyone. It's a uh, pleasure to be here. And uh, again, my name is Matt Shear. Um, the slides are already posted online, so if you're going to take a phone picture of anything, you can grab that first one and even follow along on uh, laptops, mobile devices, whatever you like. Um, I'm on Twitter at C3RKH. Uh, if anybody would care to follow me, uh, it's strictly an InfoSec handle, so I only use it to basically promote events I'm speaking at, um, events happening here in Cincinnati. Um, so it's a great resource just to keep aware of what's happening. Uh, the great thing of starting it early is that uh, there's no rush to get through this. Um, hopefully I got time to uh, go through a couple uh, demo things. I uh, wasn't sure if I would have time to get through them, so I just kind of saving them. Uh, if there was going to be time to do that. And uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, again, the topic is active defense, helping threat actors hack themselves. So just a little bit about me. I uh, already introduced myself. I, for a day job, I'm a system security engineer with First Financial Bank. Um, also, here in the keynote, you heard a lot about attending local meetup groups. I happen to run one. I'm the chair for the Simpa Security SIG. Uh, we meet the third Thursday of each month in Springdale. Uh, these meetings are free to attend. All I ask is if you're interested in coming, um, please uh, RSVP. We're on meetup.com in the Tech Life Cincinnati group. And I uh, see a lot of familiar faces, so uh, clearly the word's gotten out, but uh, also see some folks here that I'm uh, not familiar with, so if you're local, uh, by all means, stop on out, and uh, our meeting for this month is actually this Thursday. I'd uh, love to see some new faces. Uh, myself, I've spoken at a number of conferences. Uh, this is actually my third B-Sides since I live and work in Cincinnati. This one's kind of special uh, to sort of be uh, on home turf and giving a talk, and uh, I've got a few IT certifications. With that, uh, just a quick note about my day job. So the opinions expressed are solely my own and do not express the views or opinions of my employer. And a uh, long-winded disclaimer here, um, basically the idea is that the use of these tools and techniques is really at your own risk. Um, and what I try to do, uh, I'll talk about some of the conventions, I try to point out the areas that could potentially get you reported for uh, hosting malicious content. Um, so with that, I just want to talk about what active defense is. And so there's a uh, nice description here on Wikipedia. Uh, they've got an article that it can refer to a defensive strategy in the military or cybersecurity arena. The Department of Defense defines active defense as the employment of limited offensive action and counterattacks to deny a contested position to the enemy. In the cybersecurity arena, active defense may mean asymmetric defenses, namely defenses that increased costs to cyber adversaries or adversaries by reducing costs to cyber defenders. And certainly as we go through this talk, you're going to see uh, that a lot of these techniques will do just that. Um, so why are we here to talk about active defense? Uh, what makes this an interesting topic? Um, so regardless of which end of the debate you happen to fall on for hacking back, the point is, right now, today, it's illegal to do so. Um, and so active defense is really kind of just the next level beyond your conventional uh, historic honeypots, honey files, and honey nets. 
And so our objectives today are to shield and protect legitimate users at all times. We want to be diligent about protecting innocent site visitors. Uh, also, we want to frustrate malicious threat actors attempting to steal and exfiltrate data through unauthorized access, preferably by unwittingly hacking themselves. And finally, Number three, see objective number one. Uh, again, want to be very careful about protecting innocent site visitors um, so that really it's only threat actors that are stumbling into our active defense content. So the, or the focus of this presentation really is for the active defense of a public facing website. Uh, we're going to do that by baiting and setting traps for script kitties and other cyber criminals. And so there's a number of inspirations for each one of these active defense techniques. Uh, to be honest with you, some of these things go back so long that I just kind of remember looking at and I can't even really source them today. Um, but uh, some of the things in my life, uh, many, many years ago I used to study Aikido a little bit, which is uh, a martial art for using an opponent's energy or force against them. Uh, my father, I'm not sure how many original ideas he had in his life, but he had one great one for junk mail. And it was this. He would get junk mail in the mail. He would essentially take out the contents of the envelope and they would always have a return envelope and he would essentially take out the parts that would sort of attribute it back to him, that is the stuff that had his name on it, and he would really mail them back the rest of their flyer so that they would have to simply pay the postage both ways. And his contention was, if we do this, if enough people did this, we'd stop getting so much junk mail because there would be such a cost associated that they would simply find another way to try to advertise to you. Um, and then certainly from the title slide, you saw a number of animals, um, animal defenses. Uh, there's a reason that we don't go around messing with skunks on a daily basis. Uh, so, you know, certainly nature provides some good inspiration here. Uh, and then finally, nostalgia. I talked about uh, how some of these things are so old I can't quite even source them. Uh, I remember one of the things I, I sort of took was what somebody used to have in their old autoexec.bat file. Uh, for those of you who remember Windows 3.1 and prior to those, days where you would have that uh, basically startup script that would uh, you know set up the system and uh, kick off what you wanted to uh, and then finally um Security minded, yet a prankster at heart. Uh, I've definitely been guilty of having some fun at some coworkers' expenses in the past. Um, it's just, I don't know, it's in my nature. Uh, we have laughs about it, it's fun stuff. We get together sometimes and still talk about these things. And then finally, a vigilante nature. So there's just something in me that really loves seeing the bad guys kind of get what's coming to them. Uh, and so that certainly plays into this that, uh, you know, sort of uh, make it difficult for them to uh, continue just going on and popping websites all over the place. So some conventions used, I kind of just glossed over the disclaimer early in the beginning. So I kind of use this, uh, refer to as a hot water index. So you see you have an incrementing uh, thermometers to sort of gauge the likelihood that you might get um, reported for potentially hosting malicious content. Uh, to me, it's one of these things where we spend a lot of time up front protecting innocent users uh, for good reason. Um, is it possible that somebody could come across our active defense content and report it? Yeah, it's possible, but to me it's sort of like the, you know, the criminal that tries to buy drugs, illegal street drugs, and then they get nailed by the, you know, they get nailed uh, at gunpoint and robbed of their money and they don't get anything in return and they actually call the police to report it. So those things do, they can and do happen, but generally speaking, not too likely. Uh, so again, I just try to give you some good guidelines on, on staying out of hot water. <clears throat> and so, again, the most important focus of this is protecting legitimate users. And we're going to go through how you do that on a website. Um, and I apologize if some of this is basic for some of you. Uh, I don't assume people here have a background in web development at a security conference, though I'm sure some of you, a portion of you do. Uh, so a robots text file, we're going to talk about that, creating a sitemap XML file. Um, 
the important thing here is that we don't ever want to link to active defense content uh, and you probably want to use a link checker a hyperlink checker just to verify you know scan spider your own site and make sure that you don't have things that are linking to your active defense content uh, it's very important to make sure that people don't stumble across this accidentally it's really only the um, sort of motivated um, threat actors that decide hey I'm gonna go ahead and attack this site and I'm gonna look for the content that they don't want me to find um, and then also we're gonna talk about disabling directory indexing on legitimate content uh, and then finally protecting potentially protecting yourself by making use of authorized user only messages so robots text file um, there's a reference over at the top uh, it's just www.robotstxt.org that'll actually give you the format that you want to use and in this particular one um, is an example of a, a robots text file I'm using for an active defense site just really for the purposes of this demo um, and so the very first line is basically telling the internet crawlers and search engines and things that query the robots text file. Um, it's basically saying here's where the site map is which is going to tell you where all the good content is uh, and beyond that what it's usually used for you can specify for different browsers different user agents to keep crawlers uh, if you care to query those the star just simply means regardless of the web browser or the user agent that's trying to connect to our web server uh, go ahead and don't index any of this content and you can see I've got a number of directories um, in there and I've also added comments just to sort of sell um, the active defense content and everything here that's being disallowed is active defense content uh, again this is to keep a uh, search engine like Google from actually querying the site and then putting a link online to any of our active defense content uh, it's really the whole point of this file uh, and also it'll keep other things like archive.org has their Wayback engine that will uh, store historical uh, snapshots of websites it'll keep those things from happening as well so the sitemap XML files, uh, and again, the, I've got a reference there to uh, the sitemaps.org slash protocol.html. Um, this is an example of one, and uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of stuff kind of in the uh, um, body there, but really the important thing is right here on the uh, location. Uh, and on a normal website, you'd normally have m many more locations than this, but this is what really tells the internet, hey, here's where the content is. Here's where the real content is that you should go ahead and get. Um, and so the other thing I want to talk about is directory indexing. Um, so as a matter of good web security, you should pretty much always disable directory indexing on legitimate web content. That keeps somebody from going into a folder that maybe doesn't have an index file and listing out the contents to where people can query it. Um, for the purpose of active offense, um, since very commonly, even today, uh, people don't turn off directory indexing, uh, it really just makes it very easy for threat actors to really find uh, the content of your site that uh, wouldn't normally be exposed. Um, and so we actually want to leave this on uh, just for the active defense content folder. So all those things were disallowed in a robots text file. Um, that's really the, the purpose of, of turning on directory indexing for those so they go ahead and find the uh, content. And this one, you know, it's kind of a puncher's chance. It may or may not stand up, but uh, in the active defense folders, uh, maybe just consider putting in a readme text file or a readme HTML file in there, uh, just with a disclaimer, not saying, hey, welcome, but you know, if you're not authorized, you shouldn't be in here. Uh, would this stand up and protect you if somebody reported you for malicious content? Maybe, maybe not. You got nothing to lose, so maybe just go ahead and throw it out there. Uh, just, you never know, it could save you. Uh, no guarantees, but uh, worth a shot. So with that, we're going to go ahead and actually talk about the active defenses. Um, this first one, as you see, um, very low risk. I refer to this as the round trip, or yeah, the round trip round kick. Uh, the idea is that we create a bunch of unused DNS subdomain host records pointing back to the loopback address. 
And so what happens with this is that the harder the threat actors think they're hitting you, the harder they're actually just hitting themselves. And I uh, give some examples here of some subdomains that would be good candidates for this. Um, so, you know, API, app, blog, uh, on and on, mail, mail server, um, new servers, auto discover, if somebody's trying to, you know, break into your uh, um, exchange environment, WordPress. Um, so some of these, so basically if they start trying to attack these subdomains off of your, uh, your primary domain, uh, they're actually just attacking their own system since it's pointing back to the loopback address. Uh, so that's uh, one defense. Um, the second one isn't really very technical, but uh, it's more of a psychological ploy. And I simply refer to this one as stomach viver or gross out. Um, in my case, I'm using some images that somebody could maybe claim copyright, very unlikely. Um, but anyway, the idea behind this is that we're going to stage an unreferenced folder. Uh, when I say unreferenced, those are things that are in the disallow list that aren't referred to in the sitemap. Um, and we're going to use a fake door badge ID template. Um, now, if you work somewhere, if you're doing this for your company, it should look legitimate, but it should not look identical to the one that you use real life, because uh, you don't want to give somebody a template that they can easily use to social engineer their way into your door. Uh, so a very important note there. Uh, and the idea here is that we're going to place gross out pictures of choice, uh, disguised as staff photo headshots, um, just because I have a strong stomach and I can look at about anything. Uh, you know, there may be uh, threat actors out there, or maybe a little more of a weak stomach. Um, and so what I did for a lot of the content, because I first gave this presentation in front of my boss, uh, I didn't want to end up in the HR office, so it was essentially people vomiting for the most part. Uh, now I have friends that have uh, really funny senses of humor and uh, you know, there's nothing off limits for those guys, so they'll do Goat C and Meat Spin and Tub Girl and all those horrible pictures that you can imagine. Uh, in this case, I'm going to spare you that. Um, but uh, here's the idea, we have a uh, basically a fake badge template, measured out dimensions, just enough to sell it, make it look real. Um, in this case, uh, I guess I'm not the first one to rickroll everybody here today, but uh, anyway, just a picture. And again, just sort of a fake name associated with it, and there's a whole lot of images in the folder. Basically the same way, if we can make the uh, other person a little squeamish and uh, maybe make them run away, um, grabbing their, their mouth and throat and heading to the nearest trash can or, or toilet bowl or whatever. Uh, that's a win for us. Another act of defense I simply refer to as reflector madness. And so the idea behind this is that we're going to create an easy to crack password protected folder. Um, but what's waiting aside is not really something that the threat actors will expect. And uh, so i give an example of that. Um, Here's a uh, login page to a protected folder on the website. Um, and you can see it's just uh, you know, basically calling out the password. And it's prompting for a username and password to get into the folder. Uh, I'll give you guys a, you know, a, just a hint that this is incredibly easy to crack. It's probably one of the worst username password combos you could have on, say, a router. Anybody want to throw out a guess as to what the username and password is for this? Admin and password, absolutely correct. Good job. And what does that get you? So it does unlock the folder. They're probably going to see this, which is really just a uh, connection refused um, message. But what they might see is this. And what this is, is this is basically, if they're running a web server on their attack system, they're going to be looking at their own web server at this point. And the reason for that is because inside the source code for this page is an iframe that points back to the loopback address. So if an attacker running a web server locally in their system, then they may potentially attack themselves. And so especially if they have forms and that sort of thing, uh, I sort of take gl great glee in thinking that, you know, they may not recognize what they're looking at. They may even be freaked out by it psychologically because they don't understand why am I looking at my own system here. Um, but best of all would be if they, it's something maybe old they forgot, they even had the web server running and all of a sudden they're firing up burp suite and they're trying to do cross-site scripting exploits against their own stuff. Uh, then at that point they're literally hacking their own system. Uh, and then just uh, 
sort of a uh, disclaimer on the source code that uh, you know this is again just a seamless iframe and again as I stated I am not a web developer I don't even play one on IRC um, so I'm going to admit to this so you don't assume that it was coded by uh, apes at the Cincinnati Zoo just moments before I got here so this other active defense I like to call going nowhere fast um, so it's no big secret that WordPress is by far and away the most deployed content management system in the entire world and it just powers countless websites I couldn't even estimate how many there are um, but because it's so widely deployed it's also one of the most attacked, um, particularly uh, with brute force attacks by malicious threat actors. And so a quick little sort of side note about WordPress, it gets a lot of bad pub, particularly in security circles and, and really people that know better. Uh, the core product itself I find isn't as bad as the reputation. Uh, it's not to say historically that that was true. But the real problem with WordPress is that, uh, as was alluded to earlier in Coleman's talk, the more features that get bolted onto something, the bigger the footprint is, the greater chance for vulnerabilities. And there are a lot of really awful plugins for WordPress. Um, and so a lot of what happens when websites get popped with WordPress is because they're not keeping these things up to date. Maybe they have a vulnerability in the first place. Um, I'm just going to throw out an arbitrary number. Let's say you have 20% of your plugins out there with a vulnerability, either known or not. Um, if you have 10 plugins, then that means there's two of them that could be exploited to compromise the website. Um, if you have 20, guess what? Now you have four. If you have 30 plugins, and there are a lot of quote unquote web developers who are really just plug-in jockeys uh, and they will throw just an endless array of plugins to make the site look cool and do cool stuff without really thinking about the security implications. Um, so I'm going to come off that soapbox a little bit and uh, show you this active defense for uh, another login page and here is a very legitimate WordPress login page wp-login.php um, this is similar to what you guys saw a moment ago anybody want to guess the credentials for this one admin admin close but not really uh, unfortunately um, there really isn't a username and password it's really just a page that is meant to draw the attention of people trying to brute force the page and uh, I've seen enough logs uh, it's actually uh, it's kind of a cheap thrill but you know sometimes I like look in and you know I'll see the Russian Federation repeatedly over and over trying to crack the WordPress login page and it's like just keep at it guys uh, maybe you almost had it that time <laughs> so and again so it's just a completely fabricated WordPress login page. There's absolutely no user, real username or password that would work with it. Um, so we just want the uh, threat actors to spin their wheels, waste their time, energy, and resources trying to crack something that can't be cracked. Um, and it's further sold by uh, planning the appropriate folder structure and default files that give away a site uh, as a WordPress site, things like the licensed TXT file that lives in the folder root and the readme.html file that also lives in the folder root and then the three main folders of you know, WP admin, WP includes, WP content um, are all sort of in there to uh, sell it. So this other active defense that I came up with, I refer to it as pie to the face um, and so the inspiration for this one really um, was something I started toying with I think probably back in December um, because I got enamored with reading on crypto jacking um, and it was sort of funny because there was an initial little buzz and it really died down quick and then all of a sudden in the last three months you've seen a lot of websites getting popped and they end up with um, crypto mining uh, code on them that will essentially mine cryptocurrency for threat actors and particularly the more popular the site the better because now you have more people with more browsers more systems hitting the site um, and I thought well that's kind of interesting I you know the concept the amazing thing is what it would do to CPU cycles um, and so really the idea is um, that we want to use sort of disinformation and I'll get to that in a moment uh, to help them waste their time 
And uh, also, um, you'll see where I'm linking to. Uh, the other idea is to hopefully get them banned by larger service providers and also waste their CPU cycles, drain batteries on mobile devices. Um, and then, um, Really, this is just kind of using the threat actor's own technique against them uh, from that standpoint. And uh, so a quick note about the service provider angle. Um, if I ban somebody's IP address from attacking me, no big deal. You know, I've got one domain of just countless number of domains. They'll just simply move on to the next one. There's really no pain there. Um, even then, if they have a big enough botnet, they can attack from another IP address. Um, but what will happen if, say, Google or Yahoo, uh, well, not me, so yeah, which Yahoo, but Facebook, uh, Twitter, if some of these big providers start banning you, then you've got bigger problems. And I don't know what their thresholds are and, and what they'll, you know, what it takes to get them banned, but uh, it's, you know, worth a puncher's chance, I think. Um, and so the setup for this is that we have a webmaster folder and it contains a fictitious bookmarks.html file because if you have a domain that's got a webmaster and they've got a bookmarks.html file, that's a treasure trove of information that a threat actor would want because now they can you know, get a grip on, you know, sort of what things are being implemented in a site, the sites that the uh, person uses, you know, those things could even be used in watering hole attacks. Uh, there's just endless amount of information there. Um, and my idea to help them kind of waste their time on that is stage non-existent login account links uh, to popular sites and services that they would want to waste their time attempting to brute force. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned before, hopefully they trip whatever uh, thresholds that service providers have in place. And then, by the way, behind the scenes, uh, we're computationally calculating pi hundreds of thousands of times. Uh, and then we're just washing, rinsing, and repeating with that. And so this is what the bookmarks HTML file looks like. Uh, and I specifically chose Facebook, Google, LinkedIn, Microsoft Live ID, Twitter, Yahoo. Uh, anybody want to fathom a guess why I would choose those sites, what, why those would be enticing targets to a bad guy? sort of got hinted on uh, when we were listening to um, sort of how to recover um, passwords maybe from somebody who's passed on. These things are used for single sign-on all over the place. To a malicious threat actor, if you get credentials for one of these, man, you've about got keys to the kingdom because now you can log into all kinds of sites and services that use single sign-on. Um, and so, Baiting the trap is you see email addresses, webmaster at the domain I registered, cybernatty.com for all of these. Um, these are accounts that don't even exist on these services. And as I was sort of uh, playing around with this, uh, some interesting notes. Uh, got Facebook to work exactly the way I wanted where it pre-populates the username. Uh, actually couldn't, I didn't spend a lot of time on it, maybe less than 10 minutes. I couldn't reverse engineer Google's enough to get it to pre-populate the username. Uh, but the idea here is that they can read it in plain text and they'll spend cycles trying to crack Webmaster on Google's website and again potentially get them banned. If nothing else, just waste their time on it and resources. Um, LinkedIn, another one. I think that one populated, that, that one had an interesting effect. So it will populate the username into the field if you're already logged in. Uh, it represents the login page even though you're already logged in. If you're logged off, it didn't fill that in. Uh, it was sort of an interesting thing. I actually changed the Microsoft Live ID. Uh, the actual um, uh, variable here, I have it as email, and if you click on that, it'll let you try to register that email account. Um, I believe the actual correct one is username, and the reason I changed it is uh, Microsoft has been around a long time. They go back to the 1970s. Unfortunately, their um, Live ID login page also seems to have security methodologies that go back to the 70s. It'll outright tell you if your username is incorrect. Not your username or password, your username. So somebody could very easily script out a way to um, basically enumerate valid usernames for Microsoft Live um, and it'll tell you hey it's the username if you get the username right then you know you know that you just need to work on the password to crack it um, so just to try to keep that out there I went ahead and changed it um, again it does pass that into um, 
pass that along. Uh, like I said, it will then let you register that email address that's already cached in there. Um, Twitter worked exactly like I expected, and I, I believe Yahoo did as well. Um, and so the source code for this, the bookmarks HTML file, why it's pie to the face, uh, a couple reasons. One is um, I have the page set to refresh every 3.14 seconds. Um, and so what I found, uh, what I found is um, I've got, I'm calling two JavaScript files. They're really identical files, just two of them at the end of the, the file just to kind of further sell it. Uh, what this is doing is this is computing pi over and over, and it's computing it over 314,000 times, uh, each of those. So we're over 628,000 com computations for pi. I'm not interested in mining cryptocurrency. Um, I'm interested in just really tying up their CPU cycles. Um, and uh, it really uses the same technique, it's just used for an, a different purpose. Uh, and what I found is I can increment this number and it'll take even longer, the delay is even longer. But what I discovered is this, it'll actually pop up in the browser and warn the user, hey, this is taking an incredibly long time to load, you wanna kill the page. I didn't want that. One, I don't want to tip off the bad guys. I don't want them to know, hey, there's something funny going on at this page. You should look at it. Um, and then two, I don't want them to even worse if they stop the page or kill it, then this instantly stops. This is only as long as the person's there. It's not a persistent attack. Um, so that's sort of the other reason for having a bookmarks HTML file is it'll hopefully keep their interests where they keep that tab open and continue working on some other things. Um, so that's the, the really pie to the face is just computing pi a lot of times, refreshing every 3.14 seconds. And I found that I sort of, when I put in a decimal point, I, it took on less meaning. Like if I had a whole number in there, I might, I might realize it's reloading the page, but you throw a decimal point in there, it just sort of bleeds in with all the other metadata that you see when you look at web uh, page source code. Um, and so the CPU impacts to attackers is uh, on a low powered system, uh, like a dual core machine or a VM, uh, that can spike it all the way up to 100% CPU. Uh, on a moderately powered system, uh, like the workstation I have here, it'll get up to 50%. And if they're running something that's Java based and really heavy, like, um, you know, Burp Suite, um, even OWASP Zap, uh, all these Java applications just really, really eat up a lot of CPU. So if they're already running about a 50% load, this will push them all the way to the top. This is also going to grind them down to a halt while they've got that page open. Um, and then just another note, hey, if they're on a uh, mobile device and the CPU instead of running at seven, three to 7%, uh, which would be like normal idle, I think, for most systems, um, you know, they're going to be running um, PEG. That's going to really drain that battery down quick and force them to a power receptacle somewhere. So, um, and then this one, now we start getting into things that, yeah, these things might get you reported for malicious content, potentially. Again, this is why it's so important to take those early steps and protect users um, from the stuff that are legitimately using a site. Uh, but the idea here is I call it the wrong answer uh, because I'm taking the old um, 42.zip and I'm basically giving it a name like employee salary history xls.zip. Um, and so some of you know what this is, some of you don't know. Uh, what is 42.zip? Well, it's simply a 42 kilobyte compressed zip file, but when you decompress it all out, it'll expand over 4.2 petabytes worth of data. And the important thing is here that most people, most cyber or data thieving cyber criminals, they're not going to have a hard drive that large. And uh, so, just show of hands here, like who here has had to recover a physical machine because it ran out of disk space? Um, anybody? There's a few hands in there. Uh, I have, and uh, it's a real pain. In fact, I've even in the old days would have to take the drive out of the system, uh, essentially. Um, cable it off as a secondary drive on another system uh, and then delete the data off of it as a uh, secondary disk just to free up enough space to even get the thing to boot again. Uh, this one's incredibly relevant because uh, I was actually checking out my uh, 
active defense uh, website that I had running live and uh, Thursday night I was actually talking to a group in Dayton um, and we were talking about AppSec and I was talking about accidental exposure which is A3 now on the uh, OWASP top 10 list and uh, what I found is that uh, my demo didn't work with my site. When I got home later, I checked it out, and uh, sure enough, the server will respond to ping requests, but it, the web server itself isn't running because it's run out of disk space. After I logged into the cPanel, I got that pop-up. So it really grinds things down to a halt. Um, I'm kind of spoofing things on my local system just because the live site actually is still down. Um, they have, I've yet to see an update to my support ticket, so who knows how long that's gonna be. Uh, but yeah, if your hard drive fills up with data, if you try to expand a file that you think is the keys to the kingdom, that's going to be a bad day for you as a threat actor. And then um, this one I, is directly inspired by this XKCD, uh, Exploits of a Mom comic strip, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen this already, uh, probably more than once, um, but uh, again, Exploits of a Mom, so the mom gets a call from the school, hi, this is your son's school. We're having some computer trouble. Oh dear, um, did he break something? Well, in a way, did you really name your son Robert Drop Table Students? Oh yes, little Bobby Tables we call him. Well, we've lost this year's student records. I hope you're happy. And mom says, well, I hope you've learned to sanitize your database inputs. <laughs> And so the setup for this is that we're going to stage a uh, fake employee database dump file inside of an unreferenced folder. Um, and again, I'm going to make it look like a human resources folder here. Uh, we're going to give it an enticing name such as, uh, you know, we're just going to date it, human resource information system employee MySQL database backup.zip. Um, or you could have it not compressed and just put the name of SQL out there. Um, what's interesting is I actually got this from uh, somebody actually had kind of a, a course or a little program um, and they put it on the uh, um, MySQL Git repository. Um, they had it basically split out as a bunch of smaller um, SQL dump files, mini dumps that would um, essentially all ingest as one big file. I went ahead and imported the whole thing uh, and exported it out as one big um, SQL dump file um, and I think I it's you know over 160 megs um, decompressed. Uh, it's about 30 megs or so um, compressed, just to save bandwidth. Um, so hopefully the bad guys will take this because it's enticing enough, and uh, they're going to try to import it. Um, but there's something in there aside from fictitious very believable uh, employee records that they probably aren't expecting. Uh, there's some extra code in here and it's put near the bottom, not at the very bottom. You actually have to scroll up just past the comment code at the bottom of the file to see this stuff. Um, I couldn't find a way in MySQL to dump the, all of the databases, so the best I could come up with was drunk basically dumping the internal database files, MySQL, Sys, the performance schema, and the information schema. And I put information schema at the end because it's the one schema that has read-only information in there. And what I found is it will only drop it so far before it hits the point where it has the read-only data, and then it just stops doing it. But by that point, the damage was done. And for those of you who've recovered a system from a full up disk, uh, trying to recover a database once you've lost your internal database files, oh, that's a really bad day. That's even worse than the, uh, if you don't have good backups, you're pretty much you know, cooked in that situation. Uh, it's kind of funny because a lot of times the threat actors will get on their high horse and, well, you know, you should have backups and a lot of people in security, well, you know, oh, you need to have backups and so forth. Well, let's find out how well they eat their own dog food, right? So if uh, <laughs> they uh, import that uh, and try to run it, and the great thing is it takes a while. So this thing's running for a few minutes before then, you know, it, the database is wrecked and you try to restart MySQL and it just doesn't happen. Um, and so there's some other um, 
avenues for um, alternative active defense options. I'm not the only one that's doing crazy stuff like this. Um, but I think probably the one I'd most want to plug is uh, Black Hills Information Security. Um, they have ADHD, which is the Active Defense Harbinger Distribution. Um, and it's a great project. Uh, it's basically a distribution. Um, they go about it a little bit differently. So they focus a lot more on attribution. They'll use things like canary tokens to basically phone home. Um, and the idea is that, hey, we can use this to understand where the threat's coming from. Uh, I'm a little less interested in reporting people and more interested in maybe just teaching them a life lesson and, and hopefully making them uh, reconsider some of their life choices. Uh, and then finally, SANS, uh, SEC 550, uh, they have a class that's based on this distribution. Um, so if this is something that uh, is a project you really like to get running with, uh, probably a very good course to consider taking. Uh, so that's another option that's out there. Um, so with this stuff, uh, criticisms, yeah, I've gotten some and as I've given this talk and, and discussed it with other people. Um, one of them is sitting in the audience today who thought, you should really make that reflector madness log in harder to crack. Uh, now that was before I improved the payload because my philosophy was, I think there's merit to having an easy to crack thing that really makes the bad guys think, yes, I've won. And then um, in this case, it actually points them back to their own server that they could potentially try to hack. Um, so, but you're in control ultimately. You could make that thing as easy or as hard, hard to crack as you want. I went with admin and password just because I really wanted them to sort of look at their own system as uh, something to try to attack. Um, so some people that are on the penetration testing side, you know, say, hey, well, this stuff's gonna make my, my job more difficult to try to help you secure your environment. Um, so the idea here is that you really wanna have good documentation prepared in advance for white box and gray box and gray engagements. Um, and so some of the things you can explain what the content really is in your robots text file and your sitemap file to give them some guidance so they know that, hey, these things are sort of trapped and uh, I don't want to mess too much with this content. Uh, I might want to look at some things just to make sure that uh, there aren't other vulnerabilities, but uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's one of those things where hopefully if it's not a total black box engagement, um, you can sort of share that knowledge. And since you have those files, they make a great reference point to say, hey, beware of this stuff. Um, and then just some other things. Uh, I've had somebody say, well, I'm not gonna implement this. It's gonna really tick off some skilled attackers and they're gonna become vindictive and really come after me then. Um, so the whole point of this is that Malicious threat actors are really undeterred today. The reason they keep doing what they do is because they don't fear retribution, um, particularly if they're out of country. Chances are nothing will ever happen to them um, in most situations unless there's a big financial component uh, to it or a big PII breach. Um, and also the other part of that is that uh, they don't fear retaliation because hacking back's illegal uh, and they're usually using other people's uh, systems to do this stuff anyway. Um, consequently, that's why they're gonna keep it up. They're gonna keep compromising vulnerable systems. Uh, and then finally, as a, another point, if you wanna, if you're a little fearful of what may happen to you as a result of implementing this stuff, Here's some inspiration. Brian Krebs, who runs KrebsOnSecurity.com, a fantastic investigative uh, journalist, writes on information security topics. He's authored a book called Spam Nation. Uh, this guy's had death threats. He's had people try to swat him. He's had people try to you know, frame him for drug trafficking, uh, all sorts of things. The fact that this man is still alive today tells me that, uh, you know, Maybe he shouldn't be too fearful if he's still alive. Um, I'm sure he's a much bigger target than I ever would be. Uh, <laughs> and ultimately, the other thing that you read is he writes some post-mortems when people go to jail. It's amazing because then they want to become friends with him because they actually respect the fact that he took time to fight back. Um, and if you're still not convinced in this stuff, you know, if it's not up, you know, if you're not up to it, there's nothing that says you have to do it. Look, I'm just here to give an edutainment talk on some information security topics and uh, you know, take it for what it's worth. Uh, if that's something you wanna do, then do it. If uh, you're still weary, there's nothing that says you have to do this stuff. Um, so 
I've got a little bit of time here. I'll just do a couple real quick demos on some of this stuff. Um, so one of the things that you might be thinking is like, hey, I, you know, you talked about all this stuff and making sure that the bad guys will find it, but how do I really know that they're actually going to find it? Um, let me see here. That's not looking very good. Let me see if I can... I don't know if I'm getting some screen artifacting from plugging in a dongle. Let me just go ahead and relaunch his app here. Bear with me a minute. So if the question is, well, how do I know that the bad guys are really going to find this? How do I know that the malicious threat actors are actually going to find the content um, that I've put out there? Uh, one of the reasons I know that they will is because I'm familiar with um, some of the wget command line options uh, that enabled them to do this. Um, the other is because there are plenty of uh, great tools out there for testing this stuff like OWASP Zap. Uh, and quick note, it does require Java uh, just like Burp does, um, but it's a very good sort of, you know, lightweight um, tool for testing um, application security. And uh, you'll see here in a moment, let me go ahead and... Hopefully what this will uh, show everybody is just, you know, sort of how easy the starting point this stuff is. Uh, I'm literally just going to... Well, let's see here, it didn't like... Let me try something here, bear with me. I think there's a mention before that demos will fail. It's off intentionally. I'm actually spoofing it um, on my local box. There we go. I must add a typo in there. So very quickly, this is just kind of running through and crawling the stuff. And uh, apologize if it's a little bit of a eye chart on some of this stuff, but I just want to point out a couple quick things. Um, so you can see it's using the initial folder as a seed. Um, to understand where else it should start crawling. Um, not only is it not going to ignore a robot's text file definitions to, for the content it shouldn't scan, it's actually going to try to use that file against us as a seed to know, hey, the juicy stuff must be in these things they want to keep me out of. Here's where I should actually look. So it's breaking all the rules. Uh, and the same thing with the sitemap file. It's using that uh, location uh, as another seed to know what content it should go after. It's really as it starts trying to crawl this stuff. As you start looking through this stuff, here's the protected folder, uh, the webmaster folder. Uh, it's actually very easy to just hit export and uh, put this out to a CSV file. And then you can simply open it up in uh, you know, calc or Excel or, you know, really anything capable of reading CSV files, any text editor will do it, certainly. Um, let me go ahead and pull it up. I just want to put all this stuff here. Pop it up here and Okay, and naturally it opens up in the other window. Drag it over here, guys. And so at this point, it's basically in a really easy to get. I can just, you know, really even copy the URLs straight out of here, use wget curl, uh, really just copy and paste the stuff, put it directly in a browser. Uh, this isn't really too hard. Uh, as we start looking through here, you see the uh, WordPress login page, um, all the folders that sort of uh, give that away. Um, here's where, like, oh, this is juicy. This is an employee salary history spreadsheet file. Again, that's really our rename, 42.zip. Um, and you see, you know, a lot of the other content um, here. And, uh, you know, if we go on and on, uh, we, 
would see the, uh, here's the uh, database file that'll basically dump out all the MySQL internal database files, that sort of thing. Um, so that's how I know the bad guys are gonna find this stuff. Uh, I have no doubt about that. Uh, and then just show one more aspect of this, uh, and then I'll wrap it up. Um, so go ahead and demo uh, pie to the face here a little bit. So this is HTOP, and you see the first four are the CPU cores on this laptop. And you notice it's not really running resource intensive at all. Um, that's pretty lightweight. Um, so let me go ahead and uh, open up a browser window here. Here's the bookmarks file. Um, again, we, we talked about that. Um, what happened to HTOP? Did I close that out? Now look at our CPU. quite a difference from uh, just barely a couple bars on each of those cores, right? We're uh, paying, you know, hitting all the way up to 60 some percent. Uh, if this was a lower powered machine, the impact would be far worse. And you see it drop down, so that's that 3.14 second refresh, because again, I don't want to tip off the bad guys uh, as to what's going on with that. Um, so really, that's um, sort of the crux of uh, what I have. Um, So, any questions? All right, well, yes? At one point you had a screen where it was like a, a WordPress login, it was like a fake one. Mm -hmm. Do you record their inputs to use against them? Um, so yes, you can absolutely, and, and I do um, use the inputs in the logs to assemble some nice password lists for the fake WordPress login page. Uh, definitely renders itself well to that purpose. So, all right, um, if there are any other questions, uh, I'll be around if you want to hit me up and talk to me later on. Uh, again, thank you everybody for attending.